All right. Can you see a slide? Is it the presentation the slide? Yep, we can see it. Perfect. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much again for this opportunity. I am Angelita Aceves Doria, Angel for short, and I'm an entomologist currently employed as a research biologist at the USDA specific uh, Basin Ag Research Center in Hilo, Hawaii. I study the behavior and ecology of insects with the goal of developing sustainable pest management strategies in macadamia nut production in Hawaii. Today, I'm going to talk about monitoring and scouting for insect pests. But first, let me tell you about my journey. I was born and raised in the Philippines from a small island in an agricultural town. And this picture illustrates the type of experiences that I had as a child. My early exposure to agriculture inspired me to pursue a bachelor's degree in agriculture at the University of the Philippines, where I was introduced to the field of entomology. Then I pursued my master's degree at the University of Hawaii and later obtained my PhD at Virginia Tech, both in entomology. Prior to graduating, I was presented an opportunity to serve in the U.S. Army Reserves as an entomologist, primarily providing preventative medical support for our troops. After getting my doctorate, I worked as a postdoc at USDA's Appalachian Food Research Station before I started my position as an assistant professor at the University of Georgia, where I also uh, worked on pecan entomology, providing support for pecan growers. Now I am currently back with USDA, which I'm really, really thankful for. All right, my first experience, research experience in this case, was at the University of the Philippines as an undergrad research uh, assistant where I worked in the mass production of insect infesting fungus, the Methericium anisopliae, for the control of mango leaf hoppers. At UH Manoa, I worked in the classical biological control of aphids in Hawaii, where I assessed the host range establishment of a newly introduced aphid parasitoid. I also looked at the interactions among aphids and aphid attacking parasitic wasps, as well as host plant mediated interactions, including taro and cucumber. This experience allowed me to work with growers, which I truly enjoyed a lot. And at Virginia Tech, my research was focused on the brown malmorated stink bug, an invasive pest that became problematic to apple and peach growers in the mid-Atlantic United States. I worked on finding reliable means of monitoring for the stink bugs using different trapping approaches based on insect behavior. So why am I sharing all of these? I just want to emphasize that although my background is not heavily focus on ornamental or floriculture entomology. I am hoping to share some information from the systems I worked in before that could be applicable to the ornamental systems in Hawaii. So let's start with a concept of population ecology of insects. What is it? This is a field that delves into questions related to the density or number of individuals of a species in a habitat or location. It studies why population densities of some insects fluctuate dramatically while others show little variation in density. And it tries to figure out the mechanisms behind why some species are rare while others are common. And those who work in this field are referred to as insect ecologists. We are applied researchers seeking to understand the conditions that allow densities of pest insects to reach damaging levels. This could include food sources, climatic conditions, lack of natural enemies, and other things. And this knowledge helps us modify these conditions to keep the densities below those damaging levels. This ties in quite nicely to the concept of integrated pest management or IPM, which I'm pretty sure a lot of you are very familiar with. This is a sustainable approach to managing pests by combining biological, cultural, physical, and chemical tools in a way that minimizes economic, health, and environmental risks. IPM is a combination of pest management tactics that uses current and comprehensive information on the life cycle of pests and in their interactions with the environment. Its main goal is to manage pest impact by the most common, by the most economical means, and with the least possible hazard to people, property, and the environment. And voila, one of the key fundamental principles in IPM is monitoring. Knowing if and when uh, pests are present, and if they are present, do they exist in levels that require control or management? 
For example, in most situations, just because you see a single aphid doesn't mean you have to spray. I say in most situations here, since there could be instances that a mere presence of a single pest would require control, such as in biosurveillance or quarantine situations. But in most situations, one or two insects in a crop are not a major infestation requiring control. Therefore, the fundamental reasons for sampling insect populations within the context of IPM include providing reliable estimate of population density and determining how pest population relates to action thresholds, meaning will the observed numbers require management actions. And this action thresholds can vary between pests and production systems. And it's a whole another ball game, but my talk right now is very just focusing on um, uh, different options or ways to actually sample and monitor insects. So there are three main aspects of sampling for insects. First is the selection of a universe, where you have to consider the stage of the insects, the time of sampling, the habitat, or the host to sample from. An example here is the orchid aphid. Perhaps you would do a biweekly sampling or every other week sampling of all stages of the aphids, meaning immatures, the, the host, the, the, the not host, but the adults, winged adults, or the um, non winged adults or non-flowering orchids for two months. So the important uh, thing here is to be able to de define those uh, factors that may actually, that you have to make sure are consistent in between during your sampling. And next is the selection of sample unit. This is the step where you have to select the specific medium on which to count your insects of interest. It could be a leaf or a stem, or this could be a trap or use if you're using a trap. In our example here, it'd be two leaves per plant and 10 plants will be sampled in each bed. The last step is to determine the optimum stratification of sample units. It could be the top of the leaves or under the leaves, be as specific as possible for consistency reasons. In our example here, only aphids in the underside of the leaves will be counted. And this decisions could vary between pests and the host plant that you will be sampling from. Generally speaking, there are three general categories or methods of sampling, absolute, relative, and indirect. First is the absolute or direct, which requires the absolute units or numbers of abundance. It, it usually requires direct observation in single plant part or counts over a measured area. For example, counting aphids, all aphids in a taro leaf, as you can see here, or the number of insects within a square meter. It is normally expressed as density per unit area or unit of habitat. For ornamental pests, direct sampling could be done for aphids, scales, and millibugs and thrips by directly observing the presence of these insects on the plants. I would really highlight consistency in deciding the sampling unit here. It could be a leaf or a stem or flowers when doing this approach. The next sampling method is relative. As the name suggests, it provides a relative estimate of abundance, such as flight activity of insects. These numbers are normally expressed as catch or captures per unit effort or trapping unit. For example, aphids or white flies caught in yellow sticky cards for a week, or weekly number of beetles caught in a trap, or the number of insects per 10 sweeps on the ground. Here are some examples of relative sampling for scales and millibugs here that could be, uh, uh, could be useful for ornamental uh, systems as well. They have a very interesting life cycle where some of its adult forms are not mobile. Commonly, the immature stages are the ones that are disp uh, dispersive. And the non-mobile stage can remain on the plant long after they died. So it is possible that the infestation you see on leaves and stems are old infestations. In tree cropping systems, as you can see in these pictures, the use of sticky tape placed strategically on the plants and checked regularly can monitor active infestation by these insects. A different design may have to be developed, however, for ornamental plants with no twigs or branches, but the use of a sticky material may still be applicable to track the active infestation of the crawlers. The last sampling method is indirect sampling. There are instances where counting the insects or organisms is not possible or practical. Therefore, this approach measures the products or injury or damage associated with the target organisms or insects. 
For example, here, counting the holes and sawdust sticking out of twigs or branches dug out by ambrosia beetles, or counting the number of mounds built by termites, or rating the lateral branch dieback in coffee plants caused by the black twig borer, which is, I believe, a, a major pest in a lot of the ornamental systems here in Hawaii. For ornamental pests such as aphids, scales, and mealybugs, observing and rating for the presence of sooty mold may also be done as a, a relative indirect wave sampling. This insects excrete a sugary substance on the leaves called honeydew as a byproduct of their feeding. The sticky sugary substance, get, substance gives way to sooty mold development. And as you can see in this photo, using this approach may require a standardized rating scheme of how much a leaf area is covered by sooty mold. Again, highlighting the need to be consistent. Another example of indirect sampling for ornamental pests is rating for the presence of injury, as shown here by the curled leaves caused by thrips and a ficus plant. In addition to those already mentioned, another sampling technique is by knockdown. This may include using white colored fabric or cloth or anything that provides a good contrast of what you're looking for, and you shake or you jar the plant materials and you count the number of insects ending up on the material. Practicing this technique may require a bit of a standardization, meaning the amount of plant materials to be sampled should be comparable, and the intensity of shaking or jarring between samples should also be comparable. This is to avoid underestimation or overestimation based on the sampling differences. Another technique that we have used before is time sampling. As an example here, is counting the number of ambrosia beetle attacks that, um, as, uh, as you can see here, by counting the uh, sawdust again, and you can also count, the whole, count holes. But instead of just count the specific numbers per tree, we actually give ourselves three minutes to count how many did we see within that time period. This would be a good practical approach if there's a lot of organism or injury to count. Again, consistency is key here. Have a predetermined amount of time for counting, and this could be different depending on the insect of interest and practical limitations. Now, moving on to the use of traps. As mentioned earlier, traps are a key tool for monitoring insects to provide relative estimates of ab abundance. There are two main components of an insect trap. First is the attractant or attractants. Insects are behaviorally active animals that respond to several cues in their environments. They can be attracted to color and or smell like just, as, like, uh, just like us humans. In this example here, this is the black pyramid trap we have used for monitoring the brown marmorated stink bug. They are commonly infesting tree crops such as apples and peaches. Through research, it was known that a black colored pyramid trap that resembles a tree was the most attractive for these insects. In addition, an aggregation pheromone produced by male stink bugs has been identified, synthesized, produced, and tested to be a good olfactory uh, attractant for the stink bug species. And now we have the visual and olfactory attractants to lure the insects in. We also need to have a mechanism to capture and retain the attracted insects in this trapping design. So here, an inverted funnel on top of the pyramid, as you can see there, uh, had a uh, insecticidal strip um, containing uh, contained inside to actually retain and capture and kill the insects because the traps were out for about a week and we have to go back uh, weekly to, to count how many sting, stink bugs were captured. And here are different insect traps that rely primarily on visual attraction. UV light trap for nocturnal insects, yellow sticky traps for aphids, white flies, for most greenhouse pests essentially. And I just really, although this is not quite applicable here in the mainland, but I just want to kind of highlight that uh, the emerald ash borer, which is a boring pest of ash trees in the mainland US, is uh, attracted to per the color purple instead of the other colors, hence the purple color trap here. And the red sphere sticky trap is the main monitoring tool for the apple maggot in apple growing areas in the mainland. And here are different insect traps that rely primarily on olfactory attraction or smell. As mentioned earlier, aggregation pheromone lures are used for stink bugs. Mods, on the other hand, are lured primarily by using sex pheromones. And carbon dioxide beta traps are used for monitoring female mosquitoes that are seeking blood meal. 
And, and, and uh, on the lower right hand side here are, uh, is an ethanol baited lug trap uh, that is being used for monitoring the flight activity of ambrosia beetle and uh, bark beetles. And this is actually quite important when you time when the onset of the first activity and you can uh, prepare accordingly as to how to, to manage the pest. There are traps that are also designed for passive captures of insects, and there are no attractants used with this type of trap, such as the pit bull trap, which is essentially just putting a cup underground that captures ground dwelling insects as they walk. The other tra uh, trap on the, low, on the lower picture here is designed to capture uh, tree climbing insects as they go up trees. We actually used this particular trap before for pecan weevil monitoring. Since 90% of the weevils that recently emerged from the ground climbed up the trees instead of flying directly into the canopy, only 10% actually would fly directly into the canopy. Again, highlighting the importance of insect behavior as a key consideration on deciding which trap to use. in which extension team regarding pest biology and ecology for pests that you are not familiar with. There's also a list of known pests associated with several ornamental plants with information in biology and their behavior as well. And the second consideration is familiarity of your production system. Know your system. Have an inventory of which plant variety should be prioritized for monitoring certain pests. Another important consideration here is the purpose of why you're monitoring. Is it just merely to survey what pests are, pre pests are present, or is it to decide whether to manage the pests or not, which would require a more regular, continuous monitoring? And lastly, be cognizant of the practical limitations, including labor, time, and resources. The main goal essentially is to choose the most efficient and less time consuming option without sacrificing reliability. Outlined here are, are some factors that may help you to, uh, that may need to be considered to help you when monitoring for pests. One is location of infestation. Uh, take note of if it's sh uh, shaded, sunny, or vicinity to other plants. It's a, this would give you an indication of which pests would actually thrive in those conditions. Plant identity and variety as well are very important. Plant susceptibility to infestations vary by species and cultivar. And definitely plant age. Gen uh, generally speaking, newly planted plants are more prone to stressors than established plants. Hence, monitoring for the two should be strategized differently. And timing of sampling. Some insects are active at certain times of the day. So if direct observation is to be used, time of sampling should be considered. And definitely date of sampling uh, should, should be noted as well. Insect populations are affected by factors such as climatic conditions and photo period. And this could vary depending on the time of the year sampling is done. Relating to that, I want to highlight the importance of thorough and consistent record keeping when monitoring insect populations. This would allow you to have a good record of your infestation history with information in which plants and varieties are prone to attack. This would allow you to trace back the times of the year that certain pests are more abundant so you can plan accordingly. This would also give you the information in specific locations within your nursery or greenhouse where certain pests are more common. And most importantly, if you implement a management program, whether to spray or change a cultural practice, keeping a good record of your observations will allow you to assess if such programs worked or not. And record keeping must be done every time pest monitoring is being conducted. Records should include, at a minimum, the counts, the plant host or plant part, the plant stage, the location, and the date. You can also include other notable information on management programs, if any. Records should be kept in a secure yet accessible area so you don't forget to do it. And lastly, those who will monitor pests should also be trained on how to accurately record information. 
and I cannot uh, stress that enough. It really helps to have something to go back and um, it's something that you have a reliable, reliable record of something. Okay, in the next coming slides, I highlight some tips that could be useful for IPM in general for, for an ornamental systems. Okay, first, it is very important to know which insects are pests and which ones are beneficial. I uh, would say that um, I wish I could say that it's as straightfor straightforward as I hope it would be, but insects have a, a diversity of life forms that their immature stages look very different from their adult forms. So let me quiz you a bit for, uh, let me quiz you a bit here. This insects right here are the larvae and pupae of what predaceous insect? Here, sorry, uh, I meant pointing here. You can type it or shout it out. So let's get, I'm gonna pick on some of my favorite people here. Garrett, why don't you give us an answer? This one here. These are the larvae and pupa of what predaceous insect here? And voracious feeders of aphids. Or how about you, Bernice? If Garrett doesn't have an answer. Repeat <laughs> the question. What uh what um what insects those? do you think this yeah, is? Yeah, what are these? What are these insects right here? The larvae, uh, a pupa, a two larvae and pupa of what? Oh, we got an answer. We got an answer over chat. Is it an answer? Okay. Yeah, okay. Brian, Brian says ladybug. Woohoo, indeed. Ladybug, nice lady beetles. Thank you for that. All right. How about let me see? Uh okay. Doesn't let me click. Okay. Lady beetles in the air, ladybugs. How about this here? I'm not pointing to the record. Here. Can you see it? This one here. This adorably scary looking one here. Which one is this? Bernice, I'll give you. Oh, here, here. Eva says thrips question mark. Uh Another try, another try. This is a, a, a voracious feeder again of, of aphids. But if uh, type it into the chat if you were just speaking because we can't hear you uh, clearly. Pitcher bug, Brandon says. Pitcher bug. Pitcher. Is this another term, dragonflies? Um, uh, they have uh, similar, almost membranous wings as dragonflies. Uh, have you heard, uh, probably lace wings. This is actually a larva of a lace wing here. And um, yeah, if you see this, yes, if you see this uh, lady bee larva and light lace wing larva, you should be very, very uh, happy because bio, bio control is actively working out there in the field. And how about, let's see, how about, oh, okay, oops, I just gave the answer. <laughs> so the picture here on the left hand side, uh, this brown bloated aphids next to the green aphids. You probably have seen this in the, in the field, right? Should you be worried when you say uh, when you see this, or would you be thankful that you see or you're seeing this? Thankful. 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 Yes, because indeed these are parasitized aphids uh, that we call mummies um, that were stung by parasitic wasp. Uh, this is actually uh, the wasp, the female wasp in action like here. Right. Uh, this picture shows a female wasp stinging and laying an egg inside an aphid. So there is a tiny wasp larva or pupa growing inside of each of these mummies. So they, these are good signs or indicators that biological control is actively working. So I cannot uh, stress this, uh, uh, you know, strong enough that it is really is important to be able to categorize or be equipped to identify uh, pests from the ones that are beneficial or providing that ecological um, service uh, to, to the growers in general. All right, so 
Next is sanitation. First, removal of heavily infested materials from the vicinity of healthy plants should be practiced to avoid continuous cont uh, contamination. Uh, proper disposal of infested plants as well. For short-term storage, it might really be good to put the materials in covered trash cans to help with that. And uh, long-term disposal should also be really taken into consideration to minimize um, contamination on healthy plants. And within the same line, Isolation of newly obtained or purchased plant material should be practiced to avoid accidental introduction of, introduction of new pests. Inspect and observe the materials to make sure they are pest-free before putting them with the general plant collection. All right, so, and lastly, before I end this talk, I know that there's a bit of a um, information overload probably that I keep mentioning a lot of uh, trap names and methods and so on. Uh, these are the, the important takeaways that I'm hoping you remember. First is pest monitoring is an important practice that should be integrated in your pest management program. Second, there are several options and choices in how to monitor for insect pests which are behaviorally based. And third, the choice in which ones to use should be based on what's efficient and less time consuming without sacrificing reliability. And, oops, yeah. Uh, detailed and consistent record keeping is relevant in pest monitoring. And the last two points that I want to um, really highlight is be equipped to identify pest insects from beneficial insects. And lastly, preventing pests from establishing through sanitation and careful introduction of new plant materials is generally good practice to keep your production system sustainably protected. And with that, I'd like to thank you all, especially Juana and Russell for this opportunity, and I'd be happy to answer. I'll try my best to, to uh, answer your questions uh, that you may have for me this afternoon. And um, I actually did assign this to be uh, not a, a, a lengthy talk, so because um, I want to be able to discuss with you and kind of talk in detail so what would be how um, I could help with the uh, insect monitoring topic with respect to ornamental systems in Hawaii. So if you want me to discuss specifics, then there's going to be a good, a good time to do it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad that, that you left us time for discussion because I think most of the, the best information occurs when we start to discuss our, our issues directly. I just forgot to also mention my co-host, uh, Dr. Joanna Blazy, uh, who's also with us and is an entomology whiz in her own right. Yes. So we'll probably have her chime in uh, because she's had lots of experience the last few years here um, in insect pests in East Hawaii. So why don't we open it up and anybody who has questions directly related to issues they're having in terms of monitoring and scouting or, or you had a question regarding uh, the, the talk itself uh, for monitoring, please, please ask now. And, and uh, maybe I'll look around for folks. Oh man, more people's uh, videos got turned off right when we turned it to the discussion section. Maybe I'll open it up if that's okay, Russell. Please. Okay, um, thanks. Thank you, Angel, for that wonderful talk. That was a lot of great points. So I think one thing I find with a lot of growers, and hopefully you guys can chime in here, is how do you balance? It's a lot of time and labor, and that's very costly, right? So how do we balance that in a practical way? And I know Angel gave us some ways we can monitor and things like that. And I do wanna emphasize what she already did was the record keeping portion because our memory often doesn't serve us correctly. So writing that down, and I know you guys keep good records of your restricted pesticide use. And so being able to see what worked and what didn't work. And if you have records of other management that can really help going forward. But um, how do you, do you guys have any creative um, ways that you solve that problem of how do you scout um, and find the time? Do you do it when you're doing other things? Um, so you're kind of more efficient or? Or do you have a specific schedule that you follow for a certain pests that you're really concerned about? I. I... I might have actually, because of the quiz, is it because of the quiz? I'm kidding. <laughs> no more quiz. <laughs> oh, they're going they're gonna to get the quiz either no way. So. <laughs> so, Vernice, I know that, I know that you you're, said you're new and, and you're interested in, in 
learning more. So what is your agricultural systems you're working for, or you're an arborist or working on tree species, correct? I just unmuted myself because I did appreciate that uh, for the hostess, the speaker, a uh, lot of knowledge in there. No, I am just a basic everyday farmer. I do specialize in herbs, so I'm an herbalist. And my question was, I, I appreciate the strategy, the method of monitoring, you know, scouting. Do you think those types of pests, good, bad, other, are also relevant in herbal greenery vegetation? So you will not find a uh, title of specialty or expert on mine. I grew up on a farm and was farming back in almost the George Washington Carver days, actually not that long, but that's my concern. If these types of pests can be monitored, but most of all scouting and determining that there are pests there or insects, does it kind of run across the board for everything? in greenery, because I call everything just a regular, for example, a guava tree versus a mango tree? Well, definitely. There are uh, pest complex that are associated with certain crops. And uh, um, one way to start to kind of learn more about that, um, UH Extension is a tremendous uh, resource of kind of having a list of those uh, pests, especially for the economically important crops in the state. And Joanna probably is looking for, um, uh, oh, sorry, I just, uh, the uh, Crop Knowledge Master is an online um, resource that you can, you can search for specific crops and within each, uh, you, you, can, uh, you can see the list of, of uh, insects as well as the seasons that are, that you can potentially uh, associate with a, with a specific uh, crop, whether it be guava or mango. I'm not quite sure though for the other, for herbs. I'm not. Well, I'm no, actually I just wanted you to know that I'm not a botanist or anything like that. I'm just a lay person grower of greenery, but there are many more pests, insects now than there were back when I was, okay. you know, years back. So for example, now I'm familiar with the pecan or pecan, depending on who's saying it. Mm -hmm. And I noticed you had that on there. Do you think it's different in a different geographical climate versus here in Hawaii for those kind of multiplicity of insects? Um, th thank you for pointing it out. Um, so if we focus on pecan, um, I don't think we have a single tree in Hawaii. Correct me if I'm wrong. With you, there is one, but in the mainland, there uh, pecans are normally grown in the southern uh, United States. So you have uh, Texas, Oklahoma, you have Florida and Georgia, definitely, and New Arkansas. Mexico, and Arkansas, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we've got, um, some, we've got some crops that are similar to pecan here. Pecans here, Hawaii, yeah. So yeah, okay. in terms of tree <laughs> nut crops, and, yeah. So. Uh, and uh, just like I mentioned during my presentation, the climatic conditions really do uh, uh, matter when it comes to what insect pests are thriving in specific in specific locations. So in, in Georgia, a uh, big problems are uh, for pecans or aphids, but it's not much of a problem in in Texas or Oklahoma. Whereas in Texas and Oklahoma, pecan weevils are much of a problem compared to in, in Georgia. Mm -hmm. So those are the things. And then you know there are other uh, insect pests that are. Uh, that, that growers would be more worried about such uh, in um, uh, Oklahoma and Texas, uh, pecan weevil, and you have your um, uh, nutcase bearers, which the growers in Georgia don't really even bother with. So do you think the geographical or the condition of climate, that's a factor when you're seeing the great multiplication or mutiny where they multiply? Uh, you know, without, weather it's, it's no longer, it's a threat, you know, when it's versus just a few, as you said, and then they grow into a threat because they just reproduce so rapidly. Mm -hmm. Definitely so, climatic conditions are a factor, as well as what varieties are actually being planted in those locations. 
What repeat that last statement? Varieties. So, for example, focusing again on pecans in um, in Texas and Oklahoma, they're growing um, native varieties. Where are where us in in um, Georgia, they're growing more improved varieties, and that could be another factor as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. One other thing before I'm closed, I'm not leaving, but you know, mm -hmm. I'd like to you to repeat. You said there's a source that oh. have available lists history where you talk about the different types of insects. Yes, and I am going to put that link here. Great. On the uh in the chat box. Okay, great. So then we'll have excellent. Okay, mm -hmm. dokie. <laughs> Just to add to that a little, it can be quite difficult in Hawaii since a lot of growers are diversified. So mm -hmm. you'll have different, like Angel was saying, different pest complexes for each, and that's a lot of different pests to be on the lookout for. Mm -hmm. So um, that link is really helpful because you can search by commodity, you can search by um, pest type, and things like that. Thank you, Bernice, for that. Yeah, thanks, Bernice. Uh, we got a question from, from you, Glenn. Is your hand up for a question? Yeah, my hand's up for a question. Oh, great. Hey, Glenn. Hello. So, you know, based on, I guess, what I had read about integrated pest management and the scouting, you know, how do you determine the uh, threshold level for whatever particular pest that we're looking at? Since in Hawaii, we have such, uh, like uh, Joanna had mentioned, we have a diverse uh, ornamental industry. Mm -hmm. And so is it up to the uh, producer to decide what is going to be his threshold? Or, you know, at what point should the, would they make a determination as to whether they need to spray or to invoke some other control methods, because um, you know, like most people, when they see some, well, they're either going to see a pest and spray it, or wait too long and then mm -hmm. damage occurs on the uh, crop. Yes, great point, Glenn. That I was hoping won't be um, brought up during the meeting. <laughs> so that's a uh, uh, yeah, I did touch uh, that. A bit during my presentation, and um, that's the thing because I could not focus on it, unfortunately, for, for the past that we have in Hawaii. Um, uh, it really depends. Uh, I would say, like, it, I know that for really major pests in a huge uh, production systems, they've done a lot of studies on how to determine the threshold, and that takes a lot of information in the, uh, the market. Uh, uh, and also at what level you will actually start seeing injury and is that something that can be, you, you, you can wait a bit or and there's a formula that um, now well, probably Joanna and I <laughs> learn as we learn more about IPM and so on. And I, I, I cannot, uh, do you have any numbers that are associated with any ornamental pests as to what thresholds? So um, Arnold Hara, my predecessor, some of you know, um, he worked a little bit with thrips and it just depends on your system. So there is this formula and it's based on when we create best management practices for a pest and a specific commodity, part of that is like what chemicals, what cultural management tactics um, and all, all the different like management tactics and what's the cost of that management, mm -hmm. labor, cost of the chemical, everything, and versus how much damage can one insect do and how, and so that's the threshold. How much damage can one insect do? And, cause you want enough damage. Mm -hmm. if, if the cost of uh, managing it is more costly than the loss that you're gonna have from that, then don't do anything, right? And then what happens is that changes constantly. So, especially in Hawaii, since things are shipped here on boats, if Young Brothers goes up, the cost of management might go up really quickly. And so that threshold could change and it can get um, and it can get adjusted. But are there enough researchers in the university to be on it and constantly mm -hmm. coming up okay. with new, what we call economic threshold? And, and, and Angel talked about that with the action threshold. So there's your economic injury level, 
where you're starting to get serious loss, and then um, where you want to take action, where the cost of taking an action will save you um, money overall from otherwise you're going to lose too much crop if that makes sense and it can be really hard because we have so many pests in this diverse field so it's really hard to decide and a lot of times grow we, it's hard to get to all of the, the commodities so it feels mm -hmm. hard because we don't want to leave out any commodities either but like Angel said sorry Angel it, it does take a lot of research and a lot of work and a lot of years Go ahead, Angel. Sorry. And the threshold also differs depending on how, how the product will end up, you know, where, where it's going to, like Orchid, for example, if it's going to end up to be exported, you know, uh, the, the threshold can be different depending on um, if you're just kind of counting how, let's say, for example, thrips or, or aphids on uh, a group of plants that you're just maintaining as for, for example, they're meant to be exported. So exactly yeah, yeah, your treasure will be a lot lower you can when you are meant to actually ready for, for them to be sold. So right. there's a lot of factors indeed. Yeah. We've got a comment from, from Jennifer Hawkins, another extension agent on, on the chat that says they keep track of their numbers and encourage their producers to do so. And they can often see trends and easily see when they've reached economic thresholds and need to implement control. Jennifer, do you wanna talk about what some of those, the, those observations are in terms of when you're reaching economic thresholds? Because I think one of the issues here, right, is that we've got horticultural crops that they don't develop economic thresholds for, for, for our climate because we're a smaller industry, not as much money is, is put into developing economic thresholds for something like one of the major 20 food crops in the world where they, they're developing it based on, on climactic conditions where we're kind of left to do it as producers ourselves, develop our own thresholds for our individual uh, climate and crop, considering most of the time they're, they're smaller economic crops from a nationwide perspective. Sorry. Sure, I don't want to chime in, Russell. Um, my name is Jennifer Hawkins, and I'm over on Molokai, and I'm actually the edible crops agent over here. Um, but because we're limited, uh, we kind of play jack of all trades. <laughs> and so um, I think when it comes to the ornamentals, in my experience back in the States working with ornamentals, um, I think it really has to do with where your market is and um, what the ladies have mentioned here about uh, whether or not they're exporting or whether you've got plants that are your your parent plants like your mother plant that you're going to be um, that you're going to be propagating off of or whether these are plants that are just um, stock plants or whether these are going direct to the market soon uh, will determine what your uh, what your economic threshold is but the way I like to tell my producers is, you know, you're the one spending money on this crop and you're the one that needs to make money on this crop. So it's up to you individually to determine when you've gotten to that threshold. And I think it takes, you know, a year or two to really get to um, a point of looking back at your records, keeping records. So uh, we like to scout on a weekly basis, but it may, it, it depends on what season it is as far as what crop we're actually scouting. And so I think for in the ornamental area, it's a good, it's a good um, habit at least to start to get at least one crop. And you're going to, you're going to do that like every week or every two weeks. And once you start to see a pest on there, you're going to note it. And then once you start to see, you know, like 10% of your plant has pests on it. Okay. So that's a concern, but now you have 20 plants and 10% of all of your plants have pests on them. Now you should be alarmed, right? Even though it's 10%, that's still low. Um, what is the damage looking like? And if it's an ornamental plant, it has more to do with visual, right? When the customer comes and looks at that plant. And so when you start to see that visual damage, because those insects are usually there long before you see visual damage. But if you're scouting on a regular basis, or if you're using the yellow sticky cards, or for us over here, because it, um, it's a little harder to get things shipped to us, we just use yellow solo cups on a pencil. Hmm. Stick it in the pot, 
right? Put some Vaseline around it. It's very inexpensive. You can wipe the Vaseline off and you can reuse the cup. But that yellow, of course, or red um, Mm -hmm. are really those attractant colors for most of our insects. And so it's very easy to set those, either the yellow sticky cards or those yellow solo cup um, homemade traps up and kind of do a walkthrough and a visual. And that's before you even look underneath the, the, the leaves and that sort of thing. So you can just see kind of what's around because they may not be on a particular plant. They just may just be in the area to begin with. But then once you start seeing them on particular plants, that's when you really start noting, okay, on um, my gardenias, I saw XYZ. On my caladiums, I saw you know, 10, 10 bugs this week. And maybe you don't know what that bug is, but it gives you a little bit of time to go research what that bug is. And then write down like, what are the climatic conditions? And you'll start to build a trend. And you'll also start to see when, um, when you're on a treatment cycle, if those plants are still leaving, you know, there's two different things that, that I think about when I think about pests that may be in our ornamental plants. One of those is visual. So when somebody walks up to the plant, do they actually see damage? And if they see damage that is not appealing to them and you're wanting them to pay full price for that plant, that may be your economic threshold, Hmm. right? For you, that may, you may have determined right then and there, when my plants get to this point, my customer is questioning me on if I can get a discount on this plant. or if you have to pull them and set them somewhere else. The other thing is um, uh, clientele satisfaction. So if they're taking home a plant that has pests on them, right? Which we all try to avoid uh, and you get feedback from pests being on there that you didn't see and you start to get feedback on that. So those are two different observation types, I think that, that it, that it boils down to with, uh, with commercial um, horticulture type plants and our, our ornamentals. Um, for me, it's a little, uh, with the edible crops, it's a lot easier. Like Russell said, there's information out there, but also it's like, will I eat this or will I not eat this? Mm-hmm. Is there enough damage that I have to eat it myself or will somebody still pay for it? So you just got to think about, do my flowers look good? Do the leaves look good? Am I seeing any sign of damage? But if you're watching those plants every week or every two weeks um, until you see your first pest, um, it's a really good um, eye opener when you do start tracking what your pests um, are like. And if it's after a front, um, if it's been after you've been to an event and you've come home, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just, just track those types of things. We use, uh, we use composition books. They make composition books that actually have the, uh, the plastic coating. So you can take them out in the greenhouse or wherever you are. Um, but I would just encourage each of you to do that because that's what we find our producers doing. And I can go out to probably my top 10 producers. I can, even if they're younger and they're just getting started. Um, and I don't mean younger in age, I guess I mean, um, more novice and growing. And if they've started their book, they can point out to me and say, okay, now I can identify this damage from a distance. I know the minute that that insect is on my plant, because I can see a different shade of, of green, totally see a different shade of green, even if there's just five or 10 that are on that plant. And so I just encourage you to get to know your insects for your industry, but more importantly, um, record keeping is the key to finding that economic threshold for you. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting point. I was just on Oahu and had this new issue that we've been trying to figure out on Cook's Pine. And I went to the golf course and there were two Cook's Pines completely dead at this point. And, uh, and then another cook's pine well, was starting to, to turn lighter green and yellowing. And then a third, fourth and fifth cook's pine were kind of down the gradient uh, on, that, on that scale. And speaking of scale, when I ended up looking at the plant, at first we thought it was going to be something that was a root rot, something like that. They had already submitted samples for, for pathogens. 
and I found scale completely covering uh, the insides of the, the the leaf scales of the of the tree that's using scale a lot. So I found scale insect inside of the leaf scales of the cook's pine. And, and now we know when we're starting to see those patterns of, of first yellowing, of first light green and then yellowing, uh, it's most likely gonna be this, this scale insect. So that's a, that's a good point about starting to uh, um, develop an understanding what this, the, the, the symptoms are in the plant. And so the, the other thing I just want to add right quick, you saying that, is that oftentimes we, until somebody points something out, we may not know that we have a problem, even us as growers. Um, but the, the best tool that I have is a little hand magnifier, right? A hand magnifier that's on a string that I can wear around my neck. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a grade school one because it's bigger and I can get closer and I can see, you know, see better. Um, but just, you know, even if it's an employee of yours that actually does the scouting, uh, make sure that they have the equipment to do it with, whether it's the glasses with the little with the little light that we use in the lab or um, whether it's a magnifier or if they have like my iPhone, you click the button three times, the the um, the magnification comes up and uh, you basically have a microscope there where you can look at things. And so those are just a few uh, a few different things that you can do. Um, you can utilize to help identify or at least determine that you have insects. But the key is knowing what insects affect your crop. Great. One more thing, can I just add the, the good thing about record keeping, and I just wanna drive this point home, is not only helps you determine your own economic threshold, because again, another factor that goes into that calculation is what you're getting, the price point for your, your commodity, your product, but also you can look at population dynamics when that's recorded. You can look at dispersal. If you have those yellow cups or sticky cards, you know, throughout systematically dispersed throughout your orchard or field or nursery, um, where is it coming in at? All of these things over time. And we're working with biology. So things are constantly evolving and changing. So that record keeping is really, I think, key. So thank you for sharing how you guys do that, Jennifer. Sure, thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask one final question. It's going to be the last quiz question. So for those folks uh, who stayed stuck around, uh, you'll make sure to have, have the quiz answer and we'll know people that stuck around for, for the whole time. Um, and this one's going to be testing you too. So I'm sorry about this. Uh, but could you give me some estimations of how often you should scout uh, for you know the most common insect pests that we see? I'm thinking... Maybe could you cover mealybugs, thrips, uh, and aphids? Uh, those three crops, or those three uh, pests. And I'm assuming it's based on their life cycle. We would be yeah. we would be scouting them based on their life cycle. And it doesn't have to be you know exactly accurate. But what what would you recommend for these these pests? Um, um, I would refer to um, insect development is really based on um, the rate of their villain base and temperature, right? So in this very tiny insects, they can, they can, especially in, during hot weather, especially uh, mm -hmm. once we have here in Hawaii, it means they have a faster uh, developmental rate. And basing that, uh, basing on that particular um, fact, I would say that a weekly or bi-weekly sampling for aphids and white flies would be would be more, especially if you, it's a first time you're doing it, you know, mm -hmm. just kind of a, a getting an initial um, trend of um, uh, what the pest pressure is is like out in the field. Well, I'm glad so, you included white flies. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. What, what's your take on that, Joanna? I would say the same thing. And for thrips, like even in the summer, definitely weekly, depending on your crop, like but orchids. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, I know it's not practical. I mean, the biggest thing I get is I don't have time and labor is so important. And that's why I think coming together, you guys, farmers, this is and sharing your knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's hard to do and you guys are very busy, but how do people, do they multitask? I know some people that multitask, but they're the people who are spraying are also monitoring at the same time. I know it's best to do focus on one thing at a time, but 
um, I understand it's not always practical either. And that's probably not the only way to increase efficiency and monitoring. Um, and, but I'm not a grower. So you guys probably have more tips and tricks than I, than I do. Angel, I don't know if you know of any others or Russell. Um, farmers have shared that with you. Yeah, I guess I should write what is the recommended time, <laughs> oh, timeline yeah, for scouting yeah. because people can't necessarily scout weekly their whole nursery or their whole landscape. But Maybe. what you just... Sorry, yeah. Angel, go ahead. I don't know, don't. I was I think, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> go ahead. Um, I think what you were describing were greenhouse pests, what I classify as greenhouse pests, and they're all pretty fast producers. So I mm -hmm. think Angel was spot on with weekly so, or bi weekly. So even for like a mealy bug or scale, some of the what we consider slower moving pests are technically pretty fast replicating. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I dispersal does not necessarily mean um, it correlates with their productive rate. Yeah. Mm, great. Yeah. And uh, this is a funny anecdote here. I remember meeting a grower before, and it was it's not in Hawaii, but um, he would actually employ his kids to, to uh, monitor for pests. And uh, um, they, they, he would actually encourage them to attend extension meetings so they know how to identify the pests. And during the summer when uh, the bulk of their production season is, is active. So that's when the kids are earning money by <laughs> scouting for pests. Mm. I don't know. That's awesome. Great, thank you. So I'll put, we'll, we'll say weekly or bi-weekly. Hey, Josh, I saw you put your uh, video on. Do you have a question? Actually, yeah. Great. Um, so from kind of an economic standpoint, um, with all the scouting and reporting and everything that I am, uh, neglecting to do as a grower of Dracaena, um, why, what, what's your opinion of just setting up a spray schedule where I, I preemptively am using a rotation and my, my spray and just rather than, uh, doing even the mon you know I'm, i mean i understand to go monitor to see what's what what's coming out there but i i don't know i i think that i i would just go to spray more than i would almost go to a monitoring aspect of it and just um uh you know i'm just from a time standpoint and and a labor standpoint it almost seems beneficial just to go spray versus to go monitor and i was wondering what you guys think about that I think um, for the first few years, it could be economically beneficial to monitor. I know labor is expensive, but you might be, by just doing the spray schedule, you might be paying a lot more in management than you actually need. So you could be making a lot more money potentially. Also with sprays, it depends what you're spraying. You know, is it a broad spectrum? Is it targeting certain things and you have new pests coming in that it's then not affecting? And of course, as you know, you're hitting the beneficials, but also oftentimes beneficials aren't always enough. Sometimes they are, but in usually greenhouse settings that are closed walled um, to knock it below the economic threshold. So, um, I mean, to, it just depends, but I think really what needs to happen is a, an easy record tool that's easy because on paper is great, but if you have it electronically, you can run actual correlations with your other records like management that hopefully could be electronic too. And even if you don't have time to do that, you know, your extension agents could help you with that and give you some feedback. And that would be like a personalized agriculture. So there's a lot of, I think, benefit to record keeping. I know it's time consuming, but soon, you know, as the cost of growing ag gets more expensive and climate change and all of these things, we're gonna have to have that precision ag approach. And that's where I think we gotta start somewhere with the numbers. So even if you can't do it always, or you start on a schedule, trying to fit in monitoring some way, I don't know, I'll, I'll let Angel talk now. <laughs> let me, can I, if I could interrupt real quick, I'm sorry. Um, on that same vein, though, uh, say I'm I'm spending my time monitoring, and I've got a mealy bug outbreak, and it dawn and it takes over where I could have sprayed and stopped that mealy bug outbreak from the very beginning. You know, where from an economic standpoint, what if I spend my time not trying to be preemptive, but for trying to monitor where I'm, I you know, because I I have no time, right? I have you know that's zero at all. 
and, and I love to, and I, and I would love to learn this, but if I go walk, you know, 20 acres of Dracaena, it's going to be, I, I might lose, a, it might, it might get behind me. The thrip might be, you know, ahead of me. I don't even know, you know, so, but if I just go out and do tall star on everything and then rotate that, I mean, I know it's expensive and whatnot, but it's also really expensive if I lose the crop because of the bug that I might've preemptively got, you know? So I'm just wondering. If you monitor the first a little bit, you might know your hot spots. Then you put up a trap or something and just go check that trap. You're not going to have to walk the 20, you know, and then like they do with maybe blight and anthuriums where they're cutting it out, cultural management, and they're walking those rows. That's a lot of time and work, but that's not exactly what we're saying. So there's a lot of options for monitoring, right? Um, then you can know, hey, the part of my nursery that's up against this windrow or this forest is bringing in all these things you know maybe that's where I should target and you might not need to spray everything, the whole thing, yeah. you know or you or you use that as your as your indicator spot for mm -hmm. whether or not you need to start considering spraying and 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 scouting in an area close to there so that you can determine if you need to spray the rest of it and for you josh knowing your system you know and knowing you know that you do have to go through and do different management practices in your dracaena and possible employees to to try to incorporate sh shorter term scouting or monitoring into other activities and try to just put that mentality to always be checking for insect pests into any employees that would be doing um any sort of cultural activities like going through and weed whacking i know they're not necessarily checking the plants but have them check you know every other row instead of taking a break and 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 doing nothing checking their phone try to check the plants for uh for pests and diseases i'm not saying uh, employees do that or anything but i certainly check my phone a lot um and yourself like for example if you're moving cutting material out and you're taking you're you're taking cuttings in the dracaena stock plants uh, to be checking, you know, the plants as you're taking the cuttings and just use more of a conscientious mentality for scouting and monitoring to, mm -hmm. to incorporate that. Cause I know nobody's got time when they're, they're growing crops. Right. Yeah. Great. Thanks a lot. Yeah. I wanted, this is Bernice. I wanted to know if all of our setting today, I know it's being recorded, but will it be available on the YouTube site as well as the chats? You muted, Russ. Uh, yeah, yeah. I have to take some time and edit it, make sure, you know, I can take out, take out all the parts where I said something wrong. This time, Joanna told me to this record it. This is not for Hollywood. This is yeah. for knowledge. It, it just takes some time to get it uploaded to the to YouTube. That. But I'm going to run back through the video after this and I'm going to upload it pretty quickly because we had okay. some folks who couldn't get on and would like to see it anyways. So it's going to be up on the YouTube link that that I uh, that I posted here. Feel mm -hmm. free to follow that because we put extension videos up there and there's some other interesting stuff. And I'm also going to send it out in a link to uh, anybody who's registered for the webinar. Okay. Uh, make sure to check in your in your spam. Some people couldn't get on today, and, and it may have been because they, their spam email sent the invite. So so check the email for both the quiz and for the link to the video, which will be sent out uh, today. Um, and it will include the chats because there were comments made on the chat that I. No, the oh, the no. the record the recorded. Okay. Link won't the recorded video won't have any chat on there. But the oh. link uh, that uh, Angel gave out, where you can get connected with the reg other resources, that'll be oh, in there, I see. right? Oh, I see. I can I can include that in the email. Because okay. that's what I was concerned about. I thought oh, in sure. the chat people were posting things that they wanted to be included that were not verbalized. I, I think that's what I thought. I see. Okay. Yeah, but I, I, I know you know your format and platform. So, but I no, just that's a good point because I, I wouldn't have included these in in the in the email. So I'll I'll get okay. these links okay. in the email as well. The extension site for the um that Angel sent out. And let's see what else looks like. I appreciate it. <laughs> that, that might be it. Yeah. Great. Yep. 
Okay, Delkey. It's been great. Thank you. Uh, well, it looks like we're, we're at time, folks. Unless we have any other questions, we'll go ahead and say thank you to Angel and Joanna and Jennifer for, for being so helpful uh, uh, with answering questions and Angel for your presentation. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thank you much. I'm, I'm glad to, to meet you all. I'll, I'll bite virtually. <laughs> yeah, so once again, wait for an email. Uh, it will have the link to the quiz. Make sure to fill out all your CEU information and I will send the video along with that as well. Okay. Thanks folks. All right, good afternoon. Thank you. Oh, wow.